All right, so welcome to the next video uh, in regards to the uh, radioactivity subject. And uh, in this video, we're going to be using lecture slides from uh, Professor uh, Varib's uh, presentation. So give credit where credit is due. And also I'm going to use a definition that I found really helpful uh, from the minimal requirement question article from the Department of Biophysics and Cell Biology in uh, Dagotan. So uh, there we go. Let's get started. We're going to talk a little bit about annihilation. We should be somewhat familiar with it based on the x-ray uh, videos that we uh, reviewed, hopefully. We're going to briefly discuss K-capture uh, just with regards to what they want us to know, the very basics. And we're going to talk about a very important notion of the uh, spectrum of alpha and beta negative uh, radiations. So let's get started. And this is a copy paste from the uh, from the definition I found in the minimal requirement question article from uh, the Department of Biophysics and the University. So the process in which an electron and a positron, and I'm going to switch colors here, uh, collide collide with each other, and the total mass energy of this particle system is converted to the energy of two gamma photons. This is annihilation, and I just mark the uh, the most important uh, notions here. Basically, uh, we already learned that in beta positive decay, I would have um, a positron, which is the antiparticle, uh, the antiparticle two electron, and it is going to uh, to uh, be ejected out of the nucleus, and it would meet with an electron and it would collide with it, and the energy is going to be released in the form of two gamma photons that are generate opposite to one another. And this whole thing uh, plays a little bit more important role when we're talking about uh, uh, positron emission tomography or PET imaging. But right now, this is all we really need to know. Annihilation is when a positron and an electron collide, and the total energy of this interaction is, uh, is emitted in the form of two uh, gamma photons. And this obviously happens in positive beta decay. Positive uh, negative beta decay does not feature a positron. It features an electron, so there's no real annihilation. There's only annihilation when a positron is emitted. So that is that is annihilation. And uh, K capture. K capture uh, pertains to the K, K shell electron. And we already mentioned that there could be a situation in which we have uh, too many protons, we have too many protons, and we have uh, too few neutrons, and we want to kind of equilibrate and uh, maybe uh, maybe decrease the amount of protons that we have by one. And we can do that by beta positive decay. We can, and we already learned that, we can uh, emit the, the proton uh, the proton charge and through some sort of interaction turn it effectively into a neutron. And K capture is somewhat similar. Let's just say I have a nucleus here. This is my nucleus, and I'm going to draw. Uh, I'm going to arbitrarily draw the K, L, and M shells. K, L, and M shells, and uh, these are the electrons in the shells. Obviously, I'm not going to have just one electron in each cell, but shell. But this is just uh, a simple depiction. And this is my K shell, L, and M shell. And what happens at this point? Let's just say I have a bunch of protons and a bunch of neutrons all in my nucleus. And one proton in here says, hey guys, I want to turn into a neutron to make things a little bit more stable. The problem is that we have a positive charge and a neutron has no charge. So according to conservation of energy, we need to find a way to, to neutralize this charge. And we can neutralize a positive charge or achieve a zero net charge using a negative charge. And we have negative charges in the electrons. So what could occur, what could occur is that this nucleus and some nuclei have the ability to capture electrons from the K shell, thus K capture, resulting in the neutralization of the charge of a proton and turning it into a neutron. When does that happen? Well, we have an element called rubidium, and it's not it's not very uh, super important that you that you know the names. I, I don't imagine you would be asked to give an example, but rubidium-83 has 37 protons, and it can capture an electron from its K shell. It has K capturing ability, and it can turn into 
a more stable Krypton. Krypton. And Krypton obviously has uh, 36 protons, and it'll still have the same, uh, the same mass number. Because we didn't lose or gain uh, the total number of protons and neutrons, we just turned one proton into a neutron. By that, we uh, took the uh, atomic number and deducted it by one and made it slightly more stable. So this is K capture, and also in K capture, what will happen is that we can expect, being that this electron is now gone, and we don't expect to have only one electron in the K shell, but just for simplification states, this electron is now gone. It was captured by the nucleus. We can expect a, a higher shell electron to drop down and fill in the gap, and we may we may experience an X-ray associated with this transition. So we may experience a characteristic X-ray, and uh, if you're wondering how X-rays are created in these transitions, I strongly recommend you go through the X-ray videos. So this is K-capture. Essentially what it does is it takes a nucleus that has, um, that requires uh, having one proton turn into one neutron to essentially get more stable. And this is just an easy way to think about it. This uh, process is slightly more complex, but this is the essentials. We're capturing one electron, neutralizing the charge of a proton inside the nucleus, effectively turning it into a neutron and decreasing our Z, our atomic number, by one. Very good. And we're going to keep going and we're going to touch a little bit about the topic of spectrum of, of alpha and beta uh, negative radiation. We're only going to discuss the beta negative, uh, beta negative here, not the beta positive, and the alpha. And by the spectrum, what we really mean is the energy levels associated with it. And basically what we said is that we had an alpha, an alpha decay. If we have an alpha decaying uh, mother nucleus, it decays into an alpha particle and the daughter nucleus. So effectively, this particle is going to get a given set uh, package of energy because this is really the only constituent other than the daughter nucleus that is created. So when I have one nucleus that is ejecting a particle, this particle is going to get all the energy from that specific, from that specific decay. And this means it is going to be a discrete package. Discrete package. By discrete, I mean if there's an energy X released here, alpha, the alpha particle is going to have that X amount of energy associated with it. And by discrete, what we mean really is uh, an integer, uh, or I wouldn't say an integer, a, a specific packet of energy. That means it can get a specific packet of energy. It can really get a value between two energies. It can only get the, the specific value that was associated with this decay. So all you really need to know is when, when we're asked, what is the spectrum? What is the spectrum of the alpha decay? The alpha decay has a discrete spectrum associated with it because it can only get specific packets of energy that are released from the decay. And this is going to make more sense, but we're going to talk about what type of spectrum does the beta negative decay radiation uh, have? And again, when we're going to talk about the beta negative, you'll see the difference between that and the alpha decay, and it's going to make a little bit more sense. When we have beta negative decay, what we have is the mother nucleus rendered into the daughter nucleus, and we have two constituents flying off of the nucleus. And if you're not sure about the beta, the uh, process of beta negative uh, decay, I uh, strongly recommend you, you review that video. We're going to have a beta particle, a beta negative particle, and an electron, and an electron antineutrino. <coughs> and again, the electron antineutrino just have, has the same mass but no charge. Now, if I have, let's just say this X amount of energy was associated with the decay, and the alpha particle got that X amount of energy. If I have an X amount of energy, I know that it needs to be divided by these two particles because two of them are going to be flying out. The interesting thing is that the way in which this X is going to be, uh, is going to be split up between these two particles is totally random. Let's see what we mean. Let's just say this X amount of energy, we have 100% of the energy that we need to divide, to divide between these two. 
One way to divide it would be, let's just say the electron gets 80% of the energy and is shot off with kinetic energy that is equivalent to 80% of the energy associated with the decay, and the antineutrino gets 20. You may already know where I'm going with this. I can either separate it by um, giving the electron 30 and having the antineutrino uh, shot off with 70% of the decay. Basically, what I'm saying is that the electron and the antineutrino, or whatever, and the antineutrino can get anywhere between 0% and 100% of the energy associated with the decay. And when you think about it, this is an infinite, this is an infinite spectrum of values because between the number 1.0 and 2.0 you have infinite amount of numbers. You have infinite numbers. And when we're talking about this sort of spectrum, this would be a continuous, this would be a continuous spectrum. And let me show you how it looks. And this is taken from Professor Varebe's lecture slides. Why is the energy why is the energy spectrum of beta negative radiation continuous? The total energy of the beta negative particle and the antineutrino is constant. That means that if I have x of 100% to divide, I can have the beta particle get a lot of energy and I can have them get close to zero energy. And anywhere in between really would be an infinite amount, rather an infinite amount of possibilities I could, I could divide the energy between the two. And if we come back to comparing it to the alpha particle, the alpha particle isn't really uh, splitting or isn't really sharing its energy with any other particle. So all the energy that is going to be associated with the decay is going to be related to the alpha particle, and it's always going to be a discrete value. If I get X amount of energy, X amount of energy is associated with the alpha particle. Whereas here, if I get an X amount of energy, I can have a, a portion a random portion associated with the electron and a random portion associated with the antineutrino. And there's no real even split here. It can be split randomly in a, in a wide infinite spectrum. So whenever we're saying beta negative, we're saying uh, continuous spectrum, continuous spectrum. And when we're saying alpha, we're also saying uh, discrete, discrete. And this is a good time to mention that if we have gamma, it is also going to be discrete because if the gamma photon is the only thing that is associated with the decay, then it is going to get all the all the radiation, providing that it's the only thing that is happening in the decay. And obviously, beta positive is a very uh, exotic case in which we have a positron uh, that is going to undergo annihilation. So this is really this is really uh, what we're talking about when we're saying beta positive. We're speaking about positrons and annihilation. We're hardly analyzing the spectrum itself. So uh, this is the spectrum of alpha and beta. And we also discussed annihilation and k-capture. Hopefully you found this helpful. And I'll see you in the uh, next video where we are going to discuss uh, binding energy and half-lives. See you soon.